Well, thank you so much. I hope the sound is working now. Yeah? OK, great. So um, apologies for the technical problems with my, with my Zoom at the beginning. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, speak here today and present this uh, new work to you and to discuss it with you afterwards. Uh, some very, I think, interesting discussion has been prepared. Um, so this is a paper that is coming out in politics and society. So soon, uh, uh, I just received the proofs. You will, you would be able to read the published version of this. Oh, this uh, might be now a hardware uh, problem. I mean, these wires are a little dubious. This one is entirely uh, gone, the HDMI. Um, it will come back in a minute. Voila! The good old unplug and replug. Um, so this is the structure of my uh, talk and roughly the structure of the paper. Um, and the uh, argument that I want to make is relatively... Uh, I, I will explain what, uh, what asset managers are and so on in, in a little while. Uh, but for the moment, uh, I would just um, like to present to you the overall broader argument of this paper, which is that the structural power of the financial sector um, in the economy and also vis-a-vis -vis the state uh, is typically assumed to be a function of its ability to threaten to exit. So um, when uh, financial investors, banks, uh, investment funds, and so on, um, threaten to no longer lend uh, to a certain sector or to a certain firm or uh, to an entire state um, or to withdraw capital by selling bonds or by selling stocks, uh, this is a threat of exit, uh, and the terminology comes from um, Hirschman, uh, Exit, Voice and Loyalty, his famous book from the early 70s. And this uh, language uh, became very much yeah, uh, also the foundation of how scholars of corporate governance think about the relationship between shareholders and firms. Uh, but this logic has been applied to many areas. And in general, when you read about the structural power of business, um, in, in political economy and specifically also the structural power of the financial sector, then the logic, the, the causal mechanism through which uh, these actors are supposedly exercising structural power is, is this threat of exit or the actual act of exiting their investments. Because, well, firms and states depend on um, the money provided uh, by financial actors. So, but then once we uh, look at this a little more closely, um, then from a political economy perspective, then uh, there is a puzzle, which is that the ability of the financial sector to exit individual uh, investments has, uh, in a way, increased during the period of financialization, so since the 1970s, uh, because of liberalization and deregulation of financial markets. But at the same time, it has also decreased um, because of uh, macroeconomic developments that have made it so that investment opportunities for financial actors are more scarce, um, and also because of financial innovations, most importantly index funds in, in the area of corporate governance that I look at today, it's the rise of index funds really that has uh, taken this exit option away from those actors that today are the most powerful shareholders, namely these asset managers that I will be talking about, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, the three firms that really dominate the market for um, index index funds. Um, so uh, there has been, uh, yeah, mm, these two trends and, and I will show uh, or I will try to convince you that uh, exit, the, the power of the financial sector to use exit as a resource for structural power has really declined. Um, here is a little bit of their literature on um, structural power in international political economy. So this is um, a long-standing tradition going back uh, um, 
to the work of Fred Block and Lindblom about the capital strike scenario. So, um, yeah. what I just said basically already that firms and states depend on investment, um, and investment is controlled by companies and by those that provide money to companies to finance investment. Um, and, and yeah, uh, in many ways, this logic of exit-based structural power is epitomized by the impatient institutional investment. So a lot of the political economy literature that you will uh, read, the classical uh, texts such as uh, Hall and Soskis on um, varieties of capitalism, they will distinguish um, liberal market economies from coordinated market economies uh, in the sphere of corporate governance based on the prevalence of these impatient institutional investors in the US and UK versus uh, Germany, but also France, uh, where these institutional investors traditionally were less um, present and less strong. Um, and, and my point is, well, um, this is not just my point, of course, but uh, is, is that uh, these inst I I impatient institutional investors that were assumed by the sector still in the early 2000s really uh, are very different today because here Harms and others in Hall and Soskis and so on had pension funds in mind uh, who invested in a few firms and were quite exit happy um, uh, versus today's dominant shareholders, the asset managers who invest on behalf of these pension funds um, and are, yeah, much less, uh, have much fewer opportunities to use the, the exit option. So, uh, <clears throat> in a way, this, uh, this uh, is based on a view of the financial system that, is, uh, that looks like this. So, the financial, uh, the function of finance in this traditional view of uh, the role of the financial sector is financing, the financing of the non-financial economy. <clears throat> and the dominant forms are, are banks and capital markets. Uh, so the different sources of uh, financing for non-financial uh, corporations and the source of structural power is exit. And I, I want to uh, argue that uh, this has declined and what has risen is uh, uh, control as a so source of, of power, but then control is problematic, is on the one hand stronger than exit, but on the other hand weaker. Uh, okay, but uh, one, one step at a time. So the rest of the talk will be the, rise, uh, the end of exit, the rise of control, and then uh, why control is a politically very fragile source of financial sector power. Even though in principle, uh, it is stronger because when you control a company, it's a more direct mechanism to exercise power than when you simply can sell your shares, um, which is an indirect mechanism. Okay, I will show you three exhibits to make this point that the exit options have declined. This is a paper and my talk will be very much focused on the US because that's where these asset managers are most, most dominant. And uh, yeah, where I, where I have the case that I have studied most closely for this, and these arguments do not necessarily apply in the same way to all other countries, but I would say increasingly so. There was a question, I think. Um, yeah. Talk oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I will try. Uh, remind me again if I fall back to talking too quietly. Um, so here you see uh, the result of some fairly complicated calculations that I try to do. Um, this is based on a methodology that I took from uh, Till van Trick, uh, heterodox economist working in, in Germany, uh, who took it from um, another paper. The, the sources are detailed in the paper. Um, and then, yeah, I repeat these calculations based on financial accounts data. And the chart shows you that the vast majority of corporate investment in the US is financed from internal funds. That's, the, uh, that's this blue area here. Um, uh, so basically, all corporate uh, investment is, is uh, fine. In the aggregate, is financed from retained earnings or internal funds, uh, retained profits. Now, uh, the category equity shows that the stock market 
has not been a source of net financing for the corporate sector since basically 1970, since uh, this uh, time series begins. Uh, and then you can see that the contribution of equity even turned negative since the 1990s. So the stock, stock market has made, you know, uh, has made a negative contribution in the sense that uh, more money has flowed out of the uh, non-financial corporate sector than in uh, via that channel. And maybe more the most remarkable uh, thing you can see here is that even traditional loans from banks have made a negative contribution since 1990. Um, so unfortunately, it's not so easy to see loans uh, on this green part. And there are more years when loans made a negative contribution to corporate investment than a positive one. Yes? Uh, are we talking only about public companies? Um, no, this I think. Oh yes, this is only public companies. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Listed, listed companies. Yes. And so when loans are negative, it means that companies are paying more in, in interest. Uh, that means they are paying back uh, more debt right. than they uh, take on. Ah, uh, debt. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, this doesn't mean that there are many companies, of course, use a lot of debt and a lot of equity. Um, to finance their investment, but in the aggregate for the uh, listed corporate sector, it's it's like it's like this. Now wait, I'm not I'm not entirely sure this is only um, I'm not entirely sure this is only listed corporations. Actually, I, I would have thought this is uh, all corporations. Um, and now I responded because there is equity. Um, so yeah, it's it's two years ago <laughs> that I did this. Um, it could be it could be all corporations. I have to look this up. But again. Uh, I mean, only public companies post their earnings. Yes. And yes. And private companies are quiet. Yes. We'll keep the discussion for the end, except okay. if there is a very small. Okay. Okay. Um, but it's an important question. Um, now here, this is definitely only for public corporations. We zoom in on the equity category. Um, uh, so now we're looking only at equity. Um, and here you can see that the net issuance of corporate equity in the US, the black, black line, um, has been negative since at least 1996. Um, even though gross issuance has followed an upward trend, which is largely uh, just because these are nominal terms and valuations of companies have increased over time. Um, but a gross issuance has uh, increased over time but that growth has been eclipsed by the retiring of shares, via stock buybacks, um, and via mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and so that the result has been uh, yeah, negative net issuance of corporate equity via the stock market. Um, and uh, there was a peak negative equity issuance just before the uh, financial crisis at the end of the long boom that ended in 2008. Uh, and basically uh, late in the Trump years and even early in the Biden years, there has been, yeah, an even, I mean, this is similar, but uh, overall the volume of retirement of stocks is, is higher now than it, was, than it ever was. And now um, the third exhibit, I want to show you the declining size and relevance, uh, relatively uh, speaking, of the banking sector and of corporate lending. So uh, on the left-hand side, you see that uh, um, banks have been a shrinking part of the overall financial system, uh, just in terms of the assets uh, they manage. Um, which is not surprising, of course, because the growth of pension funds and mutual funds has been the uh, big development uh, over the last 50, 50 years in the US financial system. Uh, maybe a more interesting is what you can see here, which is um, the green area is corporate lending as a share of uh, the assets held by banks only. And here, too, you can see that you know, Traditional lending, we uh, locate that with banks. Uh, and then if we look what bank balance sheets look like, uh, it was a significant uh, chunk uh, of bank balance sheets still in the 1980s, but it has continuously shrunk. Uh, 
and it's but a very small part of banks' business in the U.S. today. So whichever way we look at finance really is not, you know, um, uh, for companies, um, external finance in the aggregate is not very important to fund investment. And if you look at the financial sector uh, balance sheet, then corporate lending uh, is not a very important part of how uh, financial firms make money today in, in the U.S. So that so much for uh, the end of exit, and we will still come back to what uh, index funds, how how they uh, add to this this development. Um, now. The rise of control uh, is a return, maybe, of control of financial actors. This is not a new phenomenon. Um, when we talk about what happens when institutional capital pools grow and increase their footprint in the non-financial economy, then we talk about a configuration um, akin to the one that prevailed in the United States and in Germany, in particular, uh, these two places, around 1900. And this is what Rudolf Hilferding, uh, shown here, famous uh, social, so socialist or so social democrat uh, and Marxist thinker, called finance capital. Uh, and for Hilferding, finance was not just a source of financing industry, similar to what I just tried to argue, but a means of reorganizing industry. Uh, so. Uh, um, so uh, he tells the story in, in this book, um, uh, Finance Capital, as one in which capitalists, so uh, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, as we would call them today maybe, whose profits exceeded what they could or wished to reinvest, they took their money to the bank. And then this caused the banking sector to lend ever larger sums to corporations in order to earn interest for their depositors. Um, and when, as a result, these banks acquired a permanent interest um, in corporations, that is, when they lost their, the exit option, uh, they acquired a permanent interest in these companies who became so uh, important to the solvency and profitability of the banks, then they faced the problem of control. Corporations had to be closely watched and controlled by the bank. Um, and so, in the US and in Germany, banks' role in corporate governance was then geared towards minimizing competition, maximizing profits, and thus the ability of corporations to service their debt towards these banks. Um, so debt servicing capacity was, if you will, the equivalent uh, to what we would call shareholder value today. Um, this is a bit of a crude comparison, but I just want to uh, show you that this um, situation where financial actors and non-financial corporations become very intertwined uh, and in a way that is not at arm's length uh, anymore uh, and that uh, mostly works without the exit options is not new and that uh, when that happens there is, there is the question of, of control. Um, so, one could say that Hilferding argued that the concentration of finance capital should strengthen the power uh, of finance and of the wealth owners uh, whose wealth is represented in, uh, in that way. Uh, by facilitating the coordination among fewer and more homogeneous agents. So, he saw a, a, a structural tendency in capitalism towards this, this type of concentration. Um, uh, and I think there are interesting parallels between what Hilferding called finance capital and what I would call asset manager capitalism. But of course, one important difference is that these were banks that had uh, mostly were exposed to the corporate sector, most mostly uh, via loans and lending, of course, also via shareholdings. Um, whereas today we're talking about mostly asset managers, even though many banks are also asset managers. Um, and they are exposed to the corporate sector via their holdings of stocks and bonds more than uh, through their um, lending in the, forms of, in the form of loans. Now, what's interesting is that uh, this Hilferding perspective largely disappeared from uh, 
um, Anglo political economy, except uh, uh, in this area, I think maybe the sociology of the corporate elite. So now I'm talking about the post war period um, uh, and yeah, 60s, 70s, 80s, basically, the, the time when there were, uh, when finance was weak in a way uh, and not very much on the radar of political um, scientists and political economists, uh, and nor economists for that matter. Uh, but there was this very interesting uh, literature that is cited here on the sociology of the corporate elite um, that studied uh, interlocking directorates, the so-called inner circle in the US and so on. Um, and this was also done for, for other countries, but this is the US literature. And then interestingly, uh, the French regulation school, of course, as always, um, uh, has never, yeah, never forgot about, about this, I would say. Um, and yeah, the, the famous Aglietta book about the American, about the US economy, um, describes finance capital as the ultimate mode of capital concentration that took concrete form in financial groups whose economic importance consisted in their ability to foster the cohesion of finance capital. So this was written in 1979, um, which is quite interesting. Um, but uh, one thing that needs to be said here is that uh, when Agueta looked at the actors, uh, he still basically found banks. Uh, as, as the representatives of, of finance capital, even though he did talk already about mutual funds and pension funds, institutions of contractual saving, as he called them. Uh, I'm talking about the English translation, of course, of the book. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, that there is a, uh, yeah, the, the Hilferding view of, of uh, finance, as I would call it, um, never, never really disappeared, but certainly from much of mainstream um, comparative political economy, it did. Uh, which therefore, so the mainstream view I, I refer to as the idea that, yeah, the role of finance is just to provide financing to the real uh, econ to the non-financial uh, economy, whereas uh, this um, view emphasizes the role of the financial sector as a uh, coordination uh, device uh, for the um, for the economy as a whole uh, and as a reorganizer of industry um, in Hilferding's terms, which is it, which is a very which is of course not fundamentally different. Um, you know, by lending, by providing finance, you also uh, reorganize industry, namely by directing where capital flows and where it doesn't flow. Um, but I would say that that perspective was not really, has not been really present in comparative or international political economy. <clears throat> okay, um, now we no longer are in a Hilferding world and now I want to briefly say a few words about, uh, uh, not everyone will be familiar with, with this uh, picture, uh, what asset managers are and, and where in the economy you should uh, you should place them. Uh, and here I show you the equity investment chain. Uh, there are other investment chains uh, for other assets, but this is for basically uh, corporate stock issued by corporations. The ultimate beneficiaries are always households or the state if we are talking about a state-owned enterprise. Maybe the corporations here should um, should not be here. So households and governments. Um, and basically, what happened over the last seventy years is that um, this middle has become populated with more intermediaries um, that made the investment chain longer. The flip side of this lengthening of the investment chain has been the concentration of shareholdings. Um, First, in the hands of uh, institutional investors, such as pension funds, endowments, sovereign wealth funds. And then, in the hands of commercial asset managers, to which these asset owners, institutional asset owners, have increasingly delegated their asset management. So today, these asset managers, who manage money for a fee, they, manage, they do that directly for you. you know, if you want to invest in stocks, then 
I highly recommend you don't buy individual stocks because that's very risky. Um, but probably you would invest in some highly diversified fund provided, offered by these firms. Um, and that's a large uh, chunk of their business. Uh, and then an even larger chunk of their business is institu institutional investors who also use their services instead of investing in corporate um, shares and bonds directly. Um, and so this is a capital pool that is larger than individual household savings pots. And these are even larger capital pools because they are pools of capital pools, if you will. Um, so that's why this lengthening of the investment chain, uh, the flip side of that has been a concentration um, of the shareholdings uh, of the shares issued by these corporations. Um, and another important or yeah, heuristic is that these are generally commercial uh, enterprises, that, uh, whereas these institutional investors are um, pension funds, endowments, sovereign wealth funds. They have a sort of uh, uh, public function, they, um, they are not for-profit enterprises. Uh, it would be different if you, uh, you could also add insurers here. Insurers are also asset owners, institutional investors. They, of course, have a for-profit business model. Um, so this distinction is not entirely clear, but it, it helps to make sense of this landscape, I think. Now, this chart shows you the growth of um, these institutional capital pools. Um, note, so uh, the blue line is bank credit, so the loans extended by banks, uh, and the bright line, which you can't see very well, I'm sorry, uh, are uh, the sum of pension fund assets, insurance assets, and asset managers, investment funds. So there is significant double counting in this uh, line because the asset managers, as I just explained, manage a lot of the assets of the pension funds and the insurers. Um, and also, uh, this line increases much faster because of valuation effects. Uh, stocks, which are the majority of these assets, they, their valuation has increased a lot. Whereas these bank loans, I mean, their value has also increased over time as the economy has grown, uh, but uh, not as much. But in general, you can see that um, this gap has widened a lot. And then, of course, there are asset management centers, which includes the United States. This, if we went back a few more years, years you would see how this went, um, uh, how this um, opened up. Uh, but then there are Ireland and Luxembourg, where, of course, um, yeah, the ratio here is, is 80 for Luxembourg, because Luxembourg manages, is an asset management center um, for many other countries. So, uh, for example, for Germany, uh, this line doesn't go up that much because a lot of the assets uh, of German households are managed by funds in Luxembourg. Anyway, this is just to give you a sense of this shift uh, on, a, or on a more global, global scale. Now back to the US. Um, <clears throat> this... Uh, I am not sure where uh, exhibit A is, um, but uh, I want to basically this, uh, what I just told you about the lengthening of the investment chain, uh, we can see here uh, in, in this chart that uh, shows quite a lot uh, and shows the evolu evolution of US corporate equity ownership since 1945. This is all corporate equity, not just listed firms, um, but the majority of corporate equity in the US is in listed for firms. Um, so the fact that household ownership is still relatively high today is, uh, is because um, this also includes non-listed firms, which are by definition uh, mostly held by households directly. Um, so <coughs> after World War II, this starts in 1945, uh, 
we were in the world described by um, Burley and Means in their famous uh, book from 1932 about uh, corporate control in the US, where virtually all corporate equity was held by households. There wasn't much of an investment chain then. Um, and since then, the uh, corporate equity held directly by households has declined over time. Um, and the first phase of this reconcentration began in the 1970s when new retirement legislation channeled a lot of money into pension funds. Um, so pension funds, uh, private pension funds are this pink part and public pension funds are the green part. And their share in the overall stock holdings um, or equity holdings uh, peaked, uh, I think, in 1984. Um, with 20, uh, 27%. Uh, mm. And then starting in the 19... Uh, well, starting in the 1990s, you had the growth of mutual funds, the, the, the yellow part. Um, and then in recent years, um, in particular, uh, of ETFs, exchange-traded funds, which is this little area down here, uh, who are today the dominant shareholders. So these are the asset managers. Um, you can, you know, uh, it's important to understand that pension funds didn't shrink during this period. Uh, to the contrary, they grew massively. This has been, this uh, period since here has been the period of the uh, strongest growth of these pension funds. However, they have delegated much of their asset management to these actors um, and they are holding less equity directly. Uh, which, which you can see in this chart. Now, <coughs> interestingly, uh, the dominant shareholders today are hidden uh, in this little uh, area, which is exchange-traded funds. So that's because this is basically mostly only three companies, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, that dominate this market for this investment product. So index funds that... Uh, uh, automatically replicate or track an index, usually the, or very often the main index in a country, so the S&P 500 in the US, um, and that combine this diversification with a high degree of liquidity. There were tra traditional index funds existed since basically, yeah, for a long time, uh, since the 1980s. Uh, the case for index funds had been established already in the 1970s that it was the best way for households to invest in equity because it was cheap and diversi diversified and therefore low risk. Uh, but only with the rise of uh, ETFs starting around 2000 uh, became index investing a really big thing. And, uh, and um, so, yeah, the difference is that unlike these pension funds, the impatient institutional investors, and unlike uh, hedge funds or actively investing in mutual funds, these index funds cannot sell individual companies, even if they wanted to. Uh, but they don't even want to because there isn't even a person in that fund uh, that uh, whose function would be to buy and sell individual companies. There are only people working at these funds whose uh, function is to replicate the index as best as they can and mo most of that is automated anyway. So um, their goal is to uh, track the index as closely as possible, not to beat the index by buying and selling individual stocks. Yes? Um, is the index funds, is that like direct investment or is that like the kind of derivative investment? Um, most of it today is direct. So physical, uh, so-called physical in index uh, strategies as opposed to a synthetic or derivatives based, yes. Yeah? By private pension funds, you mean family offices? <laughs> no, uh, private pension funds, oh, why, why <laughs> do you want to do that? Um, no, that they are just uh, uh, basic, hmm. interesting. <laughs> okay, how can you do that? Like closing programs. Can you can you close them? Maybe you were about to say something bad against BlackRock and yes. maybe uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> interesting, yeah. Okay, let's see. Okay. All good. 
Um, yeah, but private pension funds are just private sector pension funds, um, like uh, union pension, trade union pension funds, and sectoral pension funds, and company plans. Family offices are not in there. That would be with in the household category here. Okay, now let's take a closer look. Let's again zoom in. Let's zoom into this category. As I told you, that's three companies. And these three companies, uh, the best historical data available has recently been collected and published by these three authors. There are always some issues with uh, data quality on this because of, uh, now this is popping up again. Oh, it's, uh, I see, I see, uh, actually not enough memory. I don't know why that is, that has never happened. Slightly disturbing. I just end some applications. Uh, oh, it's Firefox that is causing this problem. Sorry. Can't quit that because that's where the zoom runs. Okay, um, yeah, you have had time now to look at this chart. You can see that the, the combined share, uh, the average combined share of BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street today in the S&P 500 is around 20%, which is, you know, what a lot of comparative or um, uh, studies of corporate control assume to be the threshold for control. And that's the high threshold. Some, some studies think 5% is already a very significant stake in a company. But here you have Vanguard uh, that is getting close to 10%. BlackRock is uh, around 8% almost in every single uh, S&P 500 company. And together, these three firms who should have, by and large, the exact same interests in corporate governance because they have the exact same business model. They're all US companies that all serve the exact same investor base with the same uh, financial product, diversified funds. So they should have very similar interests and together they hold 20%, which gives them yeah, at least um, uh, blocking minority uh, in, in shareholder votes and, and possibly more. So the question is, what do these asset managers want, right? Uh, or, or what do they want from corporations? What's, uh, what are their preferences in corporate governance? And then the second question is, do they use their control-based power? Control-based, by that I mean they control 20% of the vote um, in uh, the annual shareholder vote. And they have, of course, uh, extremely privileged access to corporate management. Um, co corporate CEOs, CFOs hold meetings with these, uh, with these firms uh, because they are their largest investors. Uh, so they have both the formal voting power and the informal so-called behind-the-scenes uh, engagement. Um, they can do both of these things. So um, in theory, they have considerable control-based power. So um, now let's zoom out again and uh, ask briefly what kind of corporate governance regime is this? Um, and here uh, I show you a table that shows the evolution of the corporate governance regime in the United States from the high concentration configuration of finance capital, uh, which I talked about earlier, which ended in the early 20th century, to the high concentration configuration of asset manager capitalism, which, emer which emerged in the early 21st century. In between, there was a period in the middle decades of the 20th century when shareholdings were truly dispersed, but not so dispersed as uh, Tristan, uh, maybe, um, uh, will tell us later in the Q&A. Um, but they were more dispersed than today and before. Uh, so, and there were no, uh, let's say, uh, th th there weren't these uh, banking or asset management conglomerates that held stakes uh, across the entire economy. Um, and so 
Those periods are usually described as first managerialism. So that was a period when corporate management was really uh, empowered and in control. Um, and shareholders were disempowered. That was generally a, a, an era of uh, financial repression. It was the Bretton Woods regime at the international level. Um, and, and finance was not, um, was not uh, generally uh, um, the most powerful actor in the economy. This changed radically starting in the 1980s. Um, I mentioned it already a little bit earlier. And in the 1980s and then 90s especially, uh, a new regime emerged, the so-called shareholder primacy regime or shareho shareholder value regime. Um, and, and the key there was that these impatient institutional investors, the pension funds, uh, they combined exit and voice. They were small enough, they were big enough to have their voice heard in corporate governance, owning up to 1%, um, you know, the, the biggest investments of the biggest pension funds were up to 1% of the equity of a, of a corporation if they had an investment in that corporation. They were not invested in all corporations. They were not fully diversified. But they were big enough to have their voice heard and uh, small enough to move nimbly in and out of individual corporations. So they could sell their stock if their voice, if management did not, if their voice was not heard, if management did not uh, follow their um, corporate governance preferences, they could sell their stock. Um, so that was considered a sort of sweet spot for shareholder power, combining exit and voice. And since then, um, these stakes have, as we just saw, uh, of the biggest investors, shareholders, increased, the size of the increase, tenfold. These investors cannot sell these stakes because you cannot sell 10% in a company uh, quickly. Um, without really uh, having huge losses because it would push down the share price. But even if they could do that, they can't in reality because much of this money is invested by index funds. Um, so a company would have to get delisted from the index uh, for, for, as, uh, for BlackRock and Vanguard to sell their shares. So we are in a very different regime. Um, <clears throat> the key, I think, uh, for me is that the interest in the individual company is very low for these asset managers. Um, uh, whereas it was always quite high under these other uh, regimes because these investors were less diversified. Um, here it was medium because these institutional investors were already quite diversified, but they still took bets on individual companies. Um, here it is low for two reasons, simply put. One is full diversification. Um, these big asset managers are fully diverse. For diversified among large listed companies. They don't hold non-listed companies. So depending on the country in Germany, that would mean you know, they miss out on a large part of the economy. In the US, they are pretty fully diversified because um, a, a large part of the economy is listed uh, on the stock exchange. So that's one reason why the interest in the individual firms is low. And the other one is related to the business model of these asset managers, which, as I said, is fee-based. And um, the fees come from the investors, the customers, the pension funds, the insurers, the individual household savers, um, who, pay, uh, for, um, who pay a small fee um, uh, for... And what they get for that is low cost exposure to the entire stock market. Um, now, BlackRock's goal is to mimic the performance of the stock market. So the performance of the stock market is going to be what it's going to be. Um, and of course, BlackRock uh, ha so, uh, has an interest in the aggregate in high asset prices because their fee is calculated as a percentage of the assets under management. If you invest um, a million dollars in the, or let's say, you know, or let's say a hundred dollars uh, and uh, you uh, pay 0.1% in fees, then that's uh, uh, one cent uh, or 10 cents um, that you pay in fees. And if that value rises to 200 euros uh, the following year, then actually BlackRock is going to earn more fees from you uh, because those are calculated on the market value of the assets. So BlackRock has an interest in 
high asset prices in the aggregate, but not necessarily in um, the best possible performance of each and every individual company in their portfolio. Uh, one reason is that they simply don't have the resources to do that. They are invested in, uh, I think, around seven, 17,000 companies around the world, uh, a very large number, and uh, they employ only about 50 or 60 people in corporate governance, so they cannot even, and you know, these people work, who are working in the corporate governance team in these large asset managers, they are a cost factor for them. So the business model is such that they um, have, a, compared to all previous corporate governance regimes, the dominant shareholders today have an uh, exceptionally low interest in individual companies in their portfolios. So, <clears throat> what time is it? I should stop soon. Uh, I started a little late, but maybe uh, I shouldn't go over time, over the one hour. Um, I will just take five more minutes to talk about the promise of universal ownership uh, and, and the reality of, of, of of universal owners. So BlackRock et al. are universal owners in the sense that they own the entire portfolio of stock listed companies. Uh, Larry Fink, has, the CEO of BlackRock, has a long tradition of emphasizing their long term orientation. Um, there are these two articles I can highly recommend. Uh, they are a very this is a legal scholar, Madison Condon, and these are two political economists. Um, they talk about the ins uh, the idea, the promise of universal ownership is, is this, simply put. Uh, diversification means that today's dominant shareholders hold the entire market portfolio. And they should, therefore, in principle, take the long view and curb the negative externalities that arise from the activities of listed corporations. Negative externalities I probably don't need to explain uh, to you. Uh, the main example is, uh, of course, carbon emissions today. Um, and so there is this idea that these asset managers might help us, you know, to do what states have not been able to do, namely to decarbonize the activities of these giant uh, corporations that we somehow all depend on and uh, therefore can't get, somehow can't get our uh, governments to force them to decarbonize faster. The catch is uh, that the interests of these asset managers are not necessarily aligned with those of the asset owners, um, households and, and, and pension funds, first and foremost. And I've listed various um, uh, mechanisms uh, why that uh, is not the case. Um, that's discussed in um, uh, this book chapter of mine that's called Asset Manager Capitalism as a Corporate Governance Regime. There, you, there I discuss these, based, this is all based on, on various literatures. What I want to now, uh, what I do in this paper is to uh, try to develop a somewhat more general argument about the nature or the, uh, of control-based power as opposed to exit-based power. And the idea is that uh, exit-based power derived its strength partly from its invisibility. The rise of uh, shareholder, the shareholder primacy regime was in part because these shareholders exercised power in a way that wasn't very visible by selling stocks, by selling and buying stocks. Uh, when, once you control, uh, as a group of uh, three companies, 20% of the uh, stocks, then uh, you are much more visible and you're much more exposed and you're much more easily your role in the economy is much more easily politicized, and is, that's exactly what we have been observing in the US um, uh, in recent years. And uh, just very briefly, uh, the interesting uh, thing about the politics of uh, asset manager regulation at the moment is that they are equally likely to be regulated from the left in the US as from the right. Um, if you so progressive Democrats criticize them for their complicity in perpe perpetuating the, out, you know, the shareholder primacy, primacy regime and for failing to act on climate change, for example, aggressively enough. And as you can imagine, Republicans uh, attack them for precisely the opposite. Um, 
and you have this thing about uh, the war on woke capital. Uh, so BlackRock uh, is targeted by Republican, very senior Republican figures, uh, including senators such as Ted Cruz, um, for their supposedly, you know, uh, for their supposed climate activism. So they are uh, between a uh, uh, rock and a hard place, if you if you will, uh, in the U.S. Um, so they seek to perform as much environmental and social stewardship as, ne as necessary uh, to appease progressives while saying and doing as little as possible that could be weaponized uh, by the right. And that is, of course, not a very sustainable position to be in. Um, and there are various fascinating examples from this year, actually, such as Larry Fink's uh, most recent annual letter to CEOs, where he writes that um, the stakeholder capitalism that BlackRock has been advocating was neither a social or ideological again, agenda, nor woke. Um, uh, and uh, Larry Fink has also said this year that he did not want to be the environmental police. Um, there is evidence that BlackRock votes much more uh, in favor uh, votes uh, much more in favor of uh, um, environment or climate related shareholder proposals in Europe than in the U.S., which is a very striking uh, fact, I think. So that's kind of smoking gun evidence that this theory of politicization. Um, that there's something to it, um, because this is mainly a danger to them in the United States, but of course that's by far the most important market for them, and also that's where they are uh, domiciled and regulated. Um, and yeah, you, you have uh, more recent moves towards uh, regulating, regulating these firms um, that could get quite, quite dangerous. I would say currently the danger is uh, graver the danger from the right for them, the regulatory risk uh, is greater from the right than from the left. Um, so yeah, I'll just end here. Uh, this is the argument um, summarized again, and I think we can move on to the discussion. Thank you. Okay.